Okay, you guys, thanks for coming. On behalf of Captain Scott Goldstein, uh, welcome to Pikesville Volunteer Fire Department. My name is Sean Barinholtz. I'm an anesthesia and adult critical care physician at Hopkins. I'm a volunteer at Pikesville, and I have the honor of serving in the medical director's office as CAR 609. On behalf of um, the medical director's office, Dr. Pollack, Dr. Sagel, who's with us also, and I think Dr. Wittberg uh, is going to be joining too. Uh, we welcome you. On behalf of the EMS office, Director Shenning, uh, Captain Willits, who's here with us today, and Lieutenant Stewart, who's probably online as well. Um, we thank you guys. We thank you for what you do, and we hope to fill kind of on this commitment that I think all of us have towards lifelong learning is kind of the, the driver behind this EMS lecture series. Uh, Kaylin in the back for running our live stream to allow people from across the county and across the state uh, to be able to join us. Uh, a big shout out to Scott Goldstein, the captain of Pikesville, for setting up all of these mannequins uh, and, and making these available for a little bit more of an interactive experience. Um, yeah, so tonight we have Dr. Kaleeb Ward, the emergency medicine at Children's National Linked Nurse Triage Line. But I've also learned from Kaleeb is He's also a very dedicated dedicated educator and super generous in your time and traveling here. And my wife told me I had to, so uh, the drive was familiar. Um, so thanks again, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I know you all have busy schedules, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to come and join with us. Um, hopefully should be taken in the context of your local and state protocols, right? So I'm going to walk you through a lot of what's in the National uh, Neonatal Resuscitation Protocol, or NRP. You should always view that in the prism of what's within your scope of practice and what your local and state jurisdiction allows you to do. Nothing supplants that. And the material we're going to review is largely based on the most recent NRP, 7th edition. Like any aspect of medicine is one of the great things uh, in the field we practice. Things change, right? And so being aware of any changes or modifications to those protocols uh, is going to be important. So the objectives today that I'm hoping we're going to be able to cover are to describe the unique aspects of newborn physiology. I promise I'm not going to take us all back to college, um, but I think it's kind of important for thinking newborn babies are really darn strange. Why are they so strange? And why is what you do different in terms of resuscitating them than an older child, than a 90-year-old woman that you might be on a call for? And so just a little bit of background physiology I think is important. So bear with me through that. Um, and then the meat of this is really we're going to walk through the neonatal resuscitation protocols with an emphasis at the beginning portions of it that should be within anyone's scope of practice. We're not going to do a whole lot about intubating neonates in the field today, okay? Um, we can uh, follow up and another time for that, for those of you crazy enough to want to do that frequently. Um, but then, the, And then the hope is at the end, uh, thanks so much for getting this set up, we'll be able to put into practice the really basic skills in terms of ventilating a newborn and pairing that with compressions uh, and some of the newborn STEM techniques. So really hands-on cementing the basic um, teaching in the beginning portion of it. So you may have noticed I am not a neonatologist. I didn't clarify, are there any NICU nurses, neonatologists in the audience? Always good to know who you're talking to, uh, to start with. Um, why is an ER doc all that interested in delivering babies? So I don't know if it's how much of a problem it has been regionally here. The DC region has been struck by closure of obstetric services. So there have now been two hospitals, United Medical Center being one of them, that have closed their OB services. So now the entire 300,000 people who live east of the Anacostia River do not have in that entire two wards of the city anyone who can deliver a baby. So you attend these meetings at the city council and you'll be shocked to hear that the two groups of people they think could do that are you all and us. They're like, well, it'll either happen in the ER or fire and EMS will take care of it. And so uh, delivery of babies has become more of a pressing concern. And certainly the newborn portion of it, I'm more comfortable with. Delivering the baby in the obstetric portion, it's been many years since my medical school OB rotation. So it's been a time for all of us to uh, brush up on our learning. Um, so the gist of it is the, and this is the uh, second of my three kids being delivered in the hospital. This is not really where the delivery is that we're gonna be focusing on today, 
but rather this situation, which is where you all come in, right? And so what I've really tried to do is be thoughtful as we walk through the NRP protocol. It's not all that relevant for you guys to be thinking about prepare your environment, have the seven person team there, have the radiant warmer set up. That's not really the environment you're going to be dealing in. So, and I want you to push me because if I've forgotten to modify for your skill set or where you are, point out that doesn't apply, Caleb. How are we going to do that differently? Uh, and I think we'll have the richest learning there. Then the other portion of it, obviously, is that ob and pediatric portion of it, beyond wanting to do the right thing uh, in the field, is certainly part of NREMT uh, exams that they set. And so it's a skill set um, and the varying skills that we all need. So deep breath, everyone hydrated, ready, objective one, physiology. All right. So babies are different than adults, and you're gonna hear that every time you see a pediatrician, right? But there's a couple of things that we need to go over to start with. Let me get, oh, that not being one of them. Let's get our screen back that I've just killed. Come on. <coughs> There we go. There we go. All right, so the normal blue blood, red blood, blood comes back to the heart, goes to the lungs, come, so you got your blue blood, the venous blood comes into the heart, goes out to the lungs, comes back, and then gets pumped out to the body. Happens totally different in kids when they're in utero. So what, any vote sister, what's doing the job of the lungs when a baby is inside in utero? The mother, anyone want to narrow, narrow that down? Which part? Mother's lungs, indirectly. So the umbilical cord, which attaches to the placenta, right? So in utero, the placenta is doing all of that work. So it's the thing that's doing your gas exchange and then indirectly the mother's lungs pumping out that CO2, right? So then you've got this umbilical vein, comes back through the baby's liver, up to the heart. And then anyone notice back to your high school biology or college biology days, blood comes out here, goes off to the lungs. In utero, what are the lungs of a baby doing? Developing. Are they getting much exposure to air in there? What do we think they're filled with? Fluid, right? So you've got these kind of useless lungs in terms of doing what they have to do once they're born, filled with fluid. So do you think it makes a whole lot of sense for the body to pump a bunch of blood to those lungs when the baby's inside? Nope. And so what happens is instead, the blood goes through this little thing here, which we call the ductus arteriosus, or through a connection between these two atria. All of that means that very little blood is going to the lungs when a baby is born, and most uh, inside, and most of it is coming out through the systemic circulation. That's really important because when the baby is born, it gives you a headliner as to which organ system is largely gonna be the cause of your problems, which is, any votes? Lungs, right? Which is not the case when you have an 85-year-old cardiac arrest call where you're much more suspicious that the heart is the core of the problem. In general, in kids, we worry more about lungs as a primary cause of cardiorespiratory arrest. It's more typically a pulmonary or respiratory problem, and then you get acidotic, and then the heart gives out. Older folks, it's kind of the reverse. It's even more so the case in newborns. So the vast majority of what we're gonna to talk today about is how do we get those lungs moving from least aggressive to more aggressive, which is why being able to ventilate a baby's lungs is a life-saving skill, uh, and why it's the one skill I want you to be able to walk out of here with today. So this is just in a little more detail showing you here placenta, blood coming back, and that's why in utero, all of this blood is kind of purple, right? We get this nice blue, red, blood comes back, goes out to the lungs, gets oxygenated, comes back red, goes out to the body. It's all kind of slushing around and mixed here centrally, and the lungs are not getting a whole lot of that blood. So, knowing that, what do we think a normal pulse ox is gonna be on a baby at time zero, right when they're born? So I'm gonna, Take you back to this just to mull on and have a think over. 70? 60? 80? 
Good. So the, you've got the core point here, which is it's not going to be a normal 95 to 100 um, pulse ox. And so 65 to 7, so 60 to 65, um, and this is from the NRP textbook, we don't expect to see an 85 to 90 until about 10 minutes. So this is your kind of reference frame. You have totally fresh newborn baby in front of you. If you're skilled enough to get a pulse ox on that baby, and we're going to talk about some tips to do that because that's no easy feat, the normal number you would expect at two minutes 65 to 70 percent. So seeing that number by itself does not mean that you have got a complicated delivery, one that needs to be intubated immediately. That just means you have a baby who's transitioning normally from life inside the uterus to life out in the world where their lungs have got to do the work. And we're going to keep coming back to this table. So what are those physiological changes that happen at birth? So the baby takes its first breath, cry, and then the umbilical cord is clamped. So that placenta that was doing all of that work is cut off. So no longer is that doing it. They take that little cry and their lungs. And so those alveoli, someone mentioned before, they're filled with fluid initially. Now they're gonna get replaced with air. And the body's pretty efficient at absorbing that fluid. Um, but it's the reason you can often hear a lot of that gurgly, crackly noise in a newborn baby, which is again, not abnormal. They've been swimming around like a little goldfish in fluid for nine months. The pulmonary blood vessel so, fire away. A bit of both. So there's natural uh, release of hormones that lead to um, constriction, but then we also do the clamping. And we'll talk briefly about kind of optimal timing for that. Um, truthfully, if you're uh, remembering to do it in a pre-hospital environment, I'm super impressed. Um, but I'll, I'll fill you in on the kind of broader context in which people think about that. Keep the questions coming. So the pulmonary blood vessels, we said inside, it doesn't make a whole lot of point to send all of that blood to the lungs, right? They're just filled with fluid. They do a little bit of practice breathing. But after birth, critical. That's what's helping to do your gas exchange. And so those pulmonary blood vessels start to dilate. And your ductus, remember we said there's that funny little plumbing connection that allowed the blood to divert away from the lungs and into the body, that gradually closes so that you pump the blood to the lungs where you want it to go to do gas exchange. And then your carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange switches and so no longer is it the placenta, it's going to be the baby's own lungs. So this is just a diagrammatic form of it, right? So someone mentioned, in fetal lung is filled with fluid. They take their first breath, second breath, and you can see how really efficient the body is at absorbing that fluid so the lungs can start to do what they're supposed to do. And same thing down the bottom here, you see the pulmonary blood vessels not getting a whole lot of blood flow here, really tight and constricted. That's because there's all these fluid-filled lungs, and then they dilate up and become plump and juicier after birth. So that's how it should work, right? What could go wrong? And there's a whole long list of this that can go wrong. And it can start in utero, right? And so that can be placental function can be impaired. Any ideas of what make, might make a placenta not work properly? Okay, so we, it's an increasing concern um, in terms of we know that if you've got intrauterine exposure to any variety of drugs, you can have a poorly functioning placenta. Trauma, so you can have placental abruption in the setting of trauma, absolutely. Any other plot guesses? So there's a whole range of different maternal medical conditions young women, older women when they're pregnant, um, and then if you have for any reason the cord um, in, in utero, you can get asphyxia from the cord getting twisted around the baby. A whole range of things that could stop that from working properly. So you may be up against it before you even deliver the baby that the placenta wasn't doing a good job and you've got a sick baby in utero who's acidotic. That baby's going to be hard, hard resuscitation work for you after delivery. Often we don't know that in the ER. Uh, you're almost certainly not going to know a lot of that uh, in the field, but it helps to get you thinking about which babies may be more challenging. Um, the lungs fail to fully inflate with spontaneous respiration. So you've got a baby who doesn't have that. We saw on the previous slide how the lungs very quickly absorb the fluid with those breaths. If the baby's not taking good breaths. If they've got a weak cry, we worry that the lungs aren't getting adequately inflated and this whole transition doesn't happen as it's supposed to. Um, the pulmonary arterioles remain constricted, so we showed how those blood vessels to the lungs plump up and start sending blood to their lungs in the baby. 
All of these are things that can go wrong in that transitioning process. And so the focus, as someone identified before, is on getting the baby breathing. We will talk about chest compressions, we will talk about access, vascular access and medications, but the mainstay, half of this textbook is all about how do you get a baby's lungs moving. From stimulating and drying them to giving them positive pressure through their intubating them if needed, and you can't get those lungs working, that transition is not there. So what do you think if you've got a baby who's not making that transition well, for whatever reason, how are you going to know that? What's up? Cyanotic with a kind of hash, with an asterisk, right? Like cyanotic more than we would expect. So staying persistently cyanotic. Yeah. Floppy and not active is one of the most uh, important things, and I think also one of the most uh, it's easy to assess, right? And we'll see some pictures through here. What's a newborn baby supposed to look like? What are their legs doing? What's that? Nothing-ish, what are they, they kind of curled up, right? Like they've got that, they kind of, and arms are bunched up like this, and their arms are like this, their legs are like this. You've got a baby who is fluffy, that when you, and how would you guys figure out if the baby is fluffy? Right, it sounds, uh, it sounds obvious, but when it's like a, a fluffy, low-toned baby, how are you going to figure that out? So a normal baby would, yeah, they'd kind of do that. What happens when I think the first and last time I mentioned blood pressure here, um, uh, I, you can make critical decisions that are going to be life-saving in the field without knowing a neonate's blood pressure. So we will perk that to one side. And then hypoxia and cyanosis. Again, the focus on neonatal resuscitation is restoring effective ventilation of the baby's lungs. And therein lies the end of your physiology lesson, all right? So we're now going to transition into uh, initial resuscitation. It would be great for me to get a setting. Has anyone uh, been involved in an out-of-hospital delivery? We have a number of hands going up. Um, uh, anyone want to share experiences from them? It's messy. Messy? Any other thoughts? So not a lot of advance warning. So the slides I'm going to present you with here with prepare your team, check your equipment, kind of take with a grain of salt. Already delivered. Already delivered, right? And so I'm not going to be doing any focus today on OB or how to deliver a baby or where to be pushing for fundal pressure. None of that. All I'm focusing on today is precisely that scenario probably. Oh my gosh, this came much faster than I was expecting. I didn't know I was pregnant. We weren't able to get to the hospital. Trauma, any number of things. And here is a baby, go. And that's the kind of scenario I want to put you in today. Um, and so it sounds like a lot of you have had life experience in this. And then family, your own children, grandchildren, uh, bring all of that to bear and as we think about this. So the first thing I want to do, is, so 
at the resuscitations you were at, how many of those babies did fine and didn't seem to need all that much from you? We've got at least one hand on the back. So that's the norm, right? So I want you to focus for the rest of this time, but also know that 85% of children, when they are born, will initiate spontaneous respirations and do that transitioning just by themselves. So if you figure this is a pretty rare event to start with, the odds are still in your favor, with the caveat that an out-of-hospital delivery is higher risk and may be associated with some of the risk factors we're going to talk about more. Most of the time, this goes just fine. Um, of the, so we're down to 15% of deliveries where they need something else. 10% is out of a, the kind of total picture of 100 will respond to just drying and stimulation, bag valve mask ventilation, some suctioning, some drying. So that's going to be what we're going to talk about. Fire away. Are these based on the health of hospital? No, this is NRP's overall stats. So yes, your numbers are going to be high, um, lower. It's going to be that 85% because um, an out-of-hospital delivery is by itself higher risk. Um, but good question again. So 3% will then initiate the respirations after PPV. So that's why we hone in on that as a skill today. 2% uh, will need to be intubated to support their respiratory function. And only 0.1% to 0.3% will require chest compressions and or epi. So really the focus is on that initial care, warming, drying, stimulating, positive pressure ventilation. And that takes care of the vast majority of uh, out of of uh, newborns who are not transitioning on their own. And this just kind of shows it in a kind of diagrammatic form. Very rarely needed by newborns administering medications. Having done residency at Hopkins, a big fancy tertiary children's center with a fancy NICU, going to NICU deliveries for multiple months through each year of training, um, where I, we were giving epinephrine. So it's unusual. Chest compressions a little more frequently, intubating certainly a little more common, PPV, and then these things are the things that really are a much bigger portion of children are needing. And so it's important that we're all um, comfortable with how to do that. And here is the scary algorithm that we're going to focus on for the rest. Um, the good news is we're going to break it down a little bit. But So this is the NRP algorithm for neonatal resuscitation. Has anyone ever done an NRP course? Recently, great. So we've got our, our instructor number two in the front row here. <laughs> She's just volunteered. So they set out these algorithms, revise them periodically with the great and the good of the national neonatology resuscitation world. Um, and it sets out here. So a green box is something that you should be doing an action. And these red ones are assessment points. And we're going to break it through. But so some of this obviously not pre-hospital pre uh, applicable, right? Antenatal counseling, not happening on the side of a highway when you're delivering a baby. Um, birth, as someone has mentioned, may already have happened. So you may not be jumping in and running this algorithm one to 10. You may be jumping in here. Um, and then we're gonna walk through the various steps. Um, and note the, our friend, the normal oxygen sets. At one minute, 60 to 65, we're not expecting to see a normal set until around 10 minutes. So prepare for delivery if you've got the luxury. So we had reference to a case where you arrive and the baby's already there. So these are the pictures and I chuckled as I saw them. We've got the uh, OR nurse counting out and lining up her equipment at nice right angles on a nice white sheet. Um, we have four people, uh, we don't know what their roles are, but running a checklist. Again, this, but assign your team roles, prepare equipment, and then a focused history to anticipate the need for resuscitation. Pause just briefly on equipment, because this is going to be context unit specific. Um, if, you, if your team was first on a scene for a delivery, what equipment do you have access to in your day-to-day -day work that you would get for a delivery? A little a, you've got a little OB kit. So we have these in the ER too, uh, and I was not shocked when I asked my colleagues. A, a number of them had no idea what was in it. They're like, I think there is a kit. It's a magical box somewhere. Uh, has anyone opened their OB kit or know what's in it? It's not sanitary if you open it. So you're like, I can't open it. I it contains a All right, great. It contains two little clamps for the 
blanket, a, 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 a thermal blanket. Okay. To wrap the mother in. Yep. And so a scalpel and scissors or something, or you've got that on you, and you, the little clamps for the cord, something to warm or dry, and then a bulb. All right, so we've got everything to do the first part. And folks, this, we're getting some universal sense that most of you would have access to all of that. So we can certainly do the first portion of the algorithm. If I were to hold up something like this. Ambulance, ambulance okay. So that's where the next portion is going to be critical. Um, and we can talk about that. So your equipment. Yes. How much does lack of prenatal care play in the likelihood that newborns will be one of the lower percentages of needing some type of resuscitation? Um. Uh, so I can't give a statistical answer. I can say anecdotally, all of the uh, ER or pre-hospital deliveries I've personally been involved with uh, through multifactorial reasons had limited access to prenatal care. Um, and then a focused history to anticipate your need for resuscitation. So any senses of what questions, right? You're arriving, you've got a baby who seems to be imminently about to deliver. You do not have a time to ask what a great grandma die of, who's got lupus in the family. What focused questions might you want to be thinking about for the mother about, uh, and or the delivery that you are about to assist with? First baby, complications, how many weeks? Did you have prenatal care? How many are you having? A uh, really important question, if you know, right? Because this whole thing becomes a whole lot more complicated if I suddenly give you the twist up. There are two babies that you're about to have to take care of. A, because you have to become, divide your team in half, and B, because there's a whole other range of complications you want to think about. Yeah, so what is the expected uh, gestational age? How many babies are expected we covered? Risk factors we covered? And then is the amniotic fluid clear? Um, anyone know why we worry about that? Meconium. Meconium, right? And so the baby is swimming around, back to our goldfish analogy in that fluid. Um, if the, there is passage of meconium, or the kind of in utero stool stuff that's lining, um, has everyone seen that at one point in their life? that first black sticky poop. Um, two reasons that's important. One, if the baby is passing that, it's a marker of distress. So that gives us more worry that there may be something in terms of the placenta or the baby's physiology. Two, what do we think that meconium is gonna be like if it is in the lungs? Bad, we have a volunteer from the front, right? Black and sticky, and so we've historically worried a lot about what's that gonna do to the lungs. Exactly what we should do in response is varied, but just knowing that a baby who's got black sticky tar in their lungs, it's gonna be real hard for those fluid-filled lungs to absorb that fluid and pop open and start ventilating. So those are babies that spend more of their time in NICUs and you would anticipate could be our harder resuscitation. So, four questions. How many babies, gestational age, risk factors, color of the fluid. Um, and those, are, again, are going to be the sorts of questions if you're calling for additional help um, in the pre-hospital environment or calling ahead to a, uh, a hospital that are going to be key for people to know. Um, and so I think a focus history around those four. And again, this is all consistent with NRP. So equipment. And here, this is very much what you have got. Um, NRP runs through a list that is certainly longer than what we have access to at our ER. But almost everywhere, some ability to warm, right? Blankets and a hat and then whatever you can do to clear an air airway. So a bulb syringe, suction catheter, not necessary the ma vast majority of time. Some ability to figure out what the baby's heart rate is, and we'll talk about why that's important, because various decision points as th we go down the tree. And then ideally, some means to ventilate. And again, if you've got, um, if you meet up in the pre-hospital environment with an ALS unit, if there's a baby who's needing someone to work on IV access, absolutely I would expect that potentially, even if you don't carry the ability to do this in your unit, I think being comfortable being able to provide bag mass ventilation to a neonate would be a critical skill for you and a team, which is why I want to focus on that. Intubate and medicate, we give cursory attention to at the end, largely so you can kind of understand the context. Uh, there are other venues for you to learn those uh, in other career plans. So equipment's going to vary, know what you've got. 
So risk factors, and we had a question um, online and then in the room a little bit. Some of these you're going to know, some of them you will not. It just is to give you a sense of deliveries that might be higher risk. Because we said 85% of these go just fine. Um, things related to the pregnancy and then uh, in terms of the mother and or the delivery. So we talked about young, uh, the gestational age, so premature babies, multiple, deli multiple babies, um, particularly important, no prenatal care. Obviously a baby who's got significant malformations, some of which are known in advance, a bunch of which are not. Um, an emergency C-section not happening in your workplace or mine if I can avoid it. Um, uh, placental abruption, so frank large amounts of bleeding um, in the setting of a delivery are usually abnormal uh, and that would make you worried about that. Uh, and then we talked about meconium or a cord that's coming out that you can see. Again, I'm not going to focus on the OB component of this. These are just markers that this baby is going to give you more concern. So, does this baby need resuscitation? Just describe what you're seeing. Purple. I heard something back here. Crying. Crying. So we can see that this, right, so we talked to before about tone, right? This baby has just been born, still hanging on by the umbilical cord, and already those legs are pulled all the way up, but this baby is most certainly deeply purple. If you saw any other patient other than a newborn, this color would be in the setting of cardiac arrest usually, right? Um, and the baby is most certainly crying. Does that baby need resuscitation? So if you've got a baby who has got term gestation, and you again get a sense of that just through life kind of seeing babies. There are people who devote careers to coming up with scoring systems where you count how many creases they have in various parts of their foot and how much hair they have on various parts of their bodies to guess the age if you don't know. Not your job or mine. Figuring out, does this roughly look like a term baby? Have they got good tone? Have they got good cry? Uh, the color by itself, we talked about, isn't really all that concerning. This baby's coming out of being in a purple environment where they were swinging their oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. This baby doesn't need much more than drying and putting directly on mom's chest. And so that's where the beginning, but now we break the algorithm down and we're really going to focus on this first part of it. So we've decided this isn't for us. You've got birth, term gestation, check, tone check, breathing and crying. Infant can stay with the mother, warm, maintain their temp, position the airway, clear secretions if needed, and do your ongoing evaluation, and there ends the lecture. You're done, right? Obviously, it doesn't always happen like that, but for many, many deliveries, there will be very little that you're required to do. Um, any of these not true, the baby seems to have low tone, they seem to be premature, they're not breathing or crying appropriately, that's where you get to work. Um, and we start talking about how to do all of these things. And this is really the crux of what we're going to take away from here today, because this box looks real simple. Uh, warm, maintain a normal temperature, position the airway, clear secretions, dry, stimulate, move on. We're going to break each of those down and make sure you can do all of those. So warming the baby is kind of critical. Any, re any sense of why babies might get cold quickly? They're, they've used to been swimming in this little uh, spa pool they were in. They're wet, really important, right? So they are going to evaporate a lot of heat because they come out soaking wet. Lots of surface area. Right, so we're going to, I said we're done with physiology, but I lied a little bit. They've got a really large surface area compared to their um, body mass, and so that makes it easier for them to uh, lose heat by radiation and convection. So these uh, newborn babies lose heat quickly. That's in a normal delivery. If you then have a sick baby, they will often then become even more hypothermic. So we had a two-week, in my last shift in the ER, two-week-old come in with concern for sepsis with a temp of 33 um, at two weeks of life, right? So babies get very cold very quickly. That in an adult would likely be associated with cardiac arrhythmias and all of the other stuff that we worry about. So hypothermia is a really easily avoidable cause of neonatal death and failure to correct that hypothermia can cause problems. So how are you going to warm the baby? 
you say other than it's like that's it's uh that's really important dry them off and and in the panic and the uh pre-hospital chaos th that could often be overlooked so appropriately drying the baby um and it's often with something that looks a little like this right um and you'll have a version of that getting your baby dry is super important any other way you're going to keep him warm the hat right everyone's seen those funny whoever got, makes the millions of dollars from those pink and blue striped versions that goes on the baby's head in the hospital um, you may have to improvise in a pre-hospital environment um, but something on their head and why why do we worry about the head so much it's big right babies are born like little aliens so they're born with these enormous heads um, by like two years old their head is half the size of it's going to be as a fully grown adult um, and you can see get some sense of that in there we would all look very strange if our head was this proportion of our body it means that's where they're going to lose a lot of their heat and it's an, another easy source for you to kind of keep the baby warm um, the v premature babies again this is more in my environment and or an uh, uh, OB service actually get put in little plastic bags much like the uh, thing Thanksgiving turkey does because um, uh, that helps keep the warmth in even more so but really premature and high-risk deliveries are outside of our wheelhouse today so if you were to get the baby say you had an imminent delivery and you managed to just make it in time to the ER and then made it my problem not yours slash my opportunity uh, we would have a radiant warmer like this for the baby right so warm source here um, and so for the baby I was mentioning that we I saw in my last shift who was two weeks old the entirety of their care including their IO their LP all took place on a radiant warmer like that so that we could keep the baby warm despite needing to access them to do various things so keeping your babies warm you're not going to have this but it's super critical do not overlook it in all of the chaos of the pre-hospital environment so the second thing it asked us to do was position the airway. Any, who wants to walk us through why some of these might be more or less correct? Why do we like this one and not like these ones? Yeah, it's all about kind of keeping an open highway there to get uh, air or oxygen. Um, and if you have the baby super extended like this, you end up kinking the airway. And if you have them super flexed like this, you're the same problem. So people talk about the kind of sniffing position here. Why, which do you think is more common that babies are hyperextended or hyperflexed? Hyperflexed, correct, and why? What's that? What we're used to? It's more specific to babies? Yeah, it's back to them being little aliens, right? Next time you see a baby, look at how big this posterior part of their head is. So it, if you just put a baby, and it's the same reason we worry about children, period, on backboards, right? It is not a neutral position for the C-spine for a child to be on a flat board because that big occiput means that you're actually flexing their neck. Um, and so that was part of the rationale for the phasing out in most settings of um, certainly backboards for c-spine tra trauma in kids um, hyperflexion there is much more common because of their big old head so who can spot what it is in the correct position there that they've done yeah and it's not under the neck it's really under the shoulders that you want to put it for a baby of this size um, under the neck there it would just kind of it would be the equivalent of trying to stabilize things or maybe kind of uh, improvising c-spine precautions that's not going to be any use in terms of actually getting a little bit more extension there so positioning the airway so so far you've got drying and you've got positioning and then clearing secretions again remember that algorithm most babies if they're doing fine you can just pass off directly to mom put, mo put the baby on mom's chest take care of the cord keep the baby dry um, and warm Secretions do not need to be cleared in every baby that is born, okay? Um, but you might consider it according to NRP if their baby's not breathing, if they've got poor tone or gasping, if the secretions seem like they're obstructing breathing or they're having troubles clearing secretions. I think this one's kind of hard to quantify, right? And I think that just involves a judgment. They all sound gurgly. We talked about how the lungs are totally filled with water um, and amniotic fluid at birth. So there's a degree of judgment about is the baby handling those secretions. Uh, if they're meconium stained, you should try and clear those secretions. But doing it unnecessarily or just doing it routinely can have negative consequences. So it can trigger a reflex. You can get laryngospasm or induce bradycardia in the baby. So don't feel 
need to be, uh, it's kind of tempting, right? You've only got three things in your OB kit and you're like, I've got this and I am going to use it because I've got one tool here to do something with. Sometimes you need this, sometimes you don't, okay? Um, and so the first technique actually does not involve this and it is literally just as simple as this baby is kind of gurgly and bubbling and spitting up, wiping away at their nose and their mouth. They'll be doing a decent job of pushing those secretions out themselves and you're literally just wiping them away with a cloth. And again, that's per NRP, not just me trying to say we don't need to do anything. Gentle suction with a bulb uh, and the recommendation is typically from mouth and then nose. Anyone got a guess why? Okay, so you think, so fill me in on that more. Okay, so why would you do the mouth first? Yeah, exactly. So if you do the nose first and they've got a large amount in the mouth and they kind of take a reflexive gasp, in theory, I'm not sure that there's studies to prove that you're going to worry about more of that fluid getting aspirated into the lungs. So the classic teaching, and again per NRP, is mouth and nose, easy, M before N in the alphabet. It's also truthfully just, there's obviously a lot more potential for secretions in the mouth. It just, I think, kind of intuitively makes sense when you see a baby, they're kind of mouth open, pulling those secretions there. Um, so mouth and then nose. The other thing you can do is tilt the baby's head to the side. Um, as is demonstrated here, and it just helps the secretions pull in this uh, kind of into the side of the cheek there and gives you more of a ta uh, kind of target. Um, otherwise, it can be a little tricky. Like, I hear a bunch of secretions, it looks like you're having trouble clearing them. I just see wet inside the mouth. Where am I actually suctioning? And that can make it a little more effective. And I think someone mentioned the ones that you've got access to it. Certainly, whoever makes the blue bulb suctions up here has the uh, corner on the market in every hospital I've ever worked in and then stimulate the baby. So who has had to provide stimulation for baby at delivery? What'd you do? I just played with her feet, rubbed her chest. Okay. Played with her uh, feet and rubbed her chest. Any other? All right. So pretty close to what most folks would recommend. Um, Uh, so rubbing the back and then uh, and I'm going to push you to go a little more than playing with the feet. We're going to go flicking the feet, right? It, um, yeah, exactly. Do you want to show us? Great. <laughs> yep. So ideally, still you want on a back, right? But this kind of this is really irritating to a baby. Um, and also, you're not shaking the baby. You're not about to give them new trauma, right? This is, I'm not going to induce a fracture. This is really irritating. And so that kind of flicking against the finger. And then you also mentioned the back. And we can do it at the same time as we are drying. So you want to show us how you're going to dry and stem at the same time? Good. And then you want to step, and then so the back, if you're doing that, you can end up, so if you've got a baby here, kind of along their spine, you're drying and at the same time providing that stem. And again, that's a safe way to be providing stem that is not going to uh, injure the baby, but kind of provides that jolt for them to start taking that first breath. When are you going to do it? So I think it's a really good question. I think if you've got a baby whose sets are improving as you would expect, who's got normal tone um, and uh, seems to be making normal baby respirations, there's no particular need to do it. If you think it looks like they are having irregular respirations, have any concern about tone, any concern about the um, hypoxia beyond the norm for the baby's uh, minutes of age, then you would do it. Truthfully, I think using the bulb in the mouth and the nose is a relative, I included the caveat of what could go wrong, but it's a pretty safe procedure. I, I think if you think it's needed, I would err on the side of doing it. But it's a great question because it's definitely gray, a gray zone. So again, in diagrammatic form, what we've just had expertly demonstrated to us, 
flicking the fingers, tapping. I always find I can get a little more force, but in a controlled way with this than I can kind of tapping the baby's feet, stimulating. Um, and again, you see this is under the back. So the, cons the spine there is obviously a kind of stable, robust structure. You worry a little more if you're doing this on the chest, right? You've got an umbilical cord that may or may not be still attached. You've got a soft, large belly that's kind of exposed. You might be drying them, but you're not going to want to do too much force on the front. And so the back is a much easier and safer target zone to be stimulating. And then umbilical cord management. So we had some people who'd done deliveries in the field. Uh, any challenges with managing the umbilical cord? No, nope. usually pretty straightforward. There's often a large amount of blood still in the placenta at the time of birth. Um, and the ideal time to clip, sir. Yeah, I think kind of we can always trim down further. A, I, I, yeah, right, which we will again won't dwell on. Uh, most of my ear colleagues would turn a slight shade of green at the notion of having to place umbilical lines. It's certainly something I am credentialed to do it, but yeah. Absolutely, and certainly if you're in a cardiac arrest or a situation in a baby where you need to give meds, uh, and I include a picture to demonstrate it, that is a way easier sight than placing an IV in often a newborn baby. So around this, no one's ever going to give you feedback for being too long in terms of clamping it. You will hear if a baby needed an umbilical line and you were not able to in the uh, hospital environment if it was trimmed too short. So yeah, great, or on the side of a little longer. Um, and. In terms of timing, truthfully, I would be, anyone want to guess how quickly they got the cord clamped in their pre-hospital deliveries? Yeah, so we talk about 30 to 60 seconds being delayed cord clamping. Frankly, that would strike me as early or on time cord clamping in a pre-hospital environment. So I think kind of get to it as you can in the normal setting. The academic uh, interest in this has been that maybe the baby would benefit from that additional blood that comes in from the placenta, be less likely to develop iron deficiency anemia over the first few months. On the counter side, maybe they get too much blood and then that breakdown of the red blood cells causes jaundice. People who do this for a living can figure out the answer. In theory, you want to clamp the cord between 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, and then the diagrammatic picture for those of you who have not done it before. So usually it is two little clamps like this that you place um, close together and then cut in between. That's what's in the kit. Great. So we have got through the beginning portion of this. We have now we are now all experts in warming, maintaining the positioning in airway, clearing secretions, and if needed, dry to stimulate. Hopefully that works. The baby restarts up to here, and then you're back here, baby on mom. And then remember we said 10% of cases, that's all that they need. And so that's 10, 10 of the 100%. So the majority of babies who need more, that's all that they need. But some of them will still not be helping you out, and they will still have either apnea or gasping or have a heart rate that's below 100. Um, and then you're going to need to do a little more. So how are you going to figure out the heart rate? I have some suggestions here. And this is again a piece of information that when you've got an ALS unit maybe coming to the scene or communicating with the hospital, telling us what that heart rate is is going to be pretty critical for us to get a sense of how sick that baby is. Stethoscope. Stethoscope. So auscultating straight to the gold standard. Um, any other votes? Yeah, so you can feel, it's kind of, it feels a little creepy. You can feel the pulse in the umbilical cord, right? So if you've got a little team together, two or three of you bedside, and you are auscultating a heart rate, how do you communicate what that heart rate is? Because it's kind of important, right? If it's an 80 heart rate or a 120 heart rate, your heart rate's 130 at the time, um, presumably too. How's your team going to know what heart rate you're auscultating? Yeah, so uh, you'll often see in a delivery room kind of the person who's uh, auscultating at the same time is just tapping away or just doing this and then someone else is watching, getting your number and then doing your 10 second count multiplying by six. But just some way of communicating so the whole team's got a sense of, oh, that's a really slow heart rate. That's a problem. Let's start expediting the next steps. Um, 
and then brachial pulses in theory, right? Like so radial, no use at all in young children. They've got those chubby little wrists. You can barely find a radial pulse to save your life. The brachial in theory better than the radial, but again, still really hard in a newborn baby. So strong your auscultation, exactly like you said. Um, and then at a push, feeling the umbilical cord. This is kind of, there are two slides that get kind of the whole text to fill it. If the baby does not have adequate spontaneous respirations and a heart rate of 100, less than one, uh, and the heart rate's not 100 beats per minute, within one minute of birth, that whole first portion of the algorithm takes one minute. So all of the warming, the drying, the stimulating, you get one minute from delivery. If you have not got a heart rate more than 100 and normal spontaneous respirations, you should start positive pressure ventilation. And that gets back to the by our 101 physiology, right? If it is not doing well by one minute, it is likely that there is too much fluid in the lungs and you need to start that positive pressure ventilation. One of the most common critiques and problems of newborn resuscitations is that we get so excited that we remembered how to stimulate the baby that we do this and we're like, maybe a little bit harder is gonna do it. And that goes on for too long. One minute, and there's not a lot of time, right? You're clamping the cord, you're figuring out, you've arrived on scene, your heart rate's still 140, you're trying to do warming, drying, stimulating, finding your OB box, getting the cord clamped. At one minute, if you've not got a heart rate of 100, you should start positive pressure ventilation. And in theory, at the same time, it would be helpful to get a pulse ox on the baby. Any ideas of how you're gonna do that? On the foot, okay. Why the foot? Okay, so we've got like, it's an easier spot to wrap it around. Any other spots you could try? If you don't have the um, pulse ox for a baby, what can you use? Any, any suggestions? I think if you haven't got one, you haven't got one, and you're stuck with your visual assessment of cyanosis, which we know is pretty inaccurate, but it's as good as you've got. Any other thoughts? The forehead and the ear. Okay, forehead or ear? With the pediatric, with the pediatric ones, the little, like, the brown tape that you can wrap around. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, so you're, you're kind of stuck with a lot of it. The mo you don't carry the proper that, Yeah, so if you haven't got the, those, then you're stuck. Remembering your framework, some of the indications when you might think about putting a pulse ox on. Most, so NRP recommends if you've got the ability, and it can be even this kind of version of it, across the hand um, and to do the baby's right hand. And that goes back to your funny physiology there that you've got that duct linking the blue and the red blood. This right hand is the only one that's typically what we call a preductal set. So feet absolutely are one of the easier ways you can wrap it around. And if that's what you can get, that's what you can get. Um, an ideal would be a preductal and the manufacturers design it to go across the hand though sometimes it's easier to get around the wrist. Um, and NRP has two pages devoted to the minutiae of that. But in theory, the right hand there is going to be your best spot. So PPV, let's briefly go over the mechanics of it and then we're going to do some practice. Ventilating the lungs is the single most important step in neonatal resuscitation and it's the one skill that I want to make sure everyone is really comfortable with. We've gone over for the algorithm, some of the indications to start it, apnea, gasping respirations, a heart rate less than 100, or an oxygen below your target range. So here are the steps I want us to think about, and this is again as laid out in NRP. Clearing secretions from the airway, we've already addressed. Position yourself at the head of the baby. Position the baby's head and neck. We talked about how there's a tendency for them to be too flexed, so you probably need to extend it a little bit with that towel under their shoulders. Select an appropriately sized mask. If, again, this is assuming a unit has arrived that's got the ability to provide um, something smaller than a pediatric one, right? Because those are still going to be too big. Um, in general, just room air for initial resuscitation in babies. And then start your ventilations. And you can either use one or two hand. We can practice both of those together. And your initial rate of ventilations is 40 to 60 beat breaths per minute. And we will not dwell on the boringness of peak. And then once you're doing this, you've got to figure out if it is working. How are you going to figure out if you are delivering effective ventilations to the baby? Seeing chest rise, and you guys have got great mannequins here, at least the ones that I uh, tested out before the presentation. Uh, you're going to see chest rise. The baby starts doing what you want them to do, which is to pink up and to get some normal tone and to get their heart rate to improve. So, uh, chest rise, breath sound, skin color. 
uh, NRP says the single most valuable predictor of whether you're giving uh, adequate ventilations is whether you see changes in the heart rate. I think the more immediate one is chest rise that you should be looking for to make sure you've got good seal and all of those things, but watching that heart rate is critical. So before we do the kind of hands-on practice component, there are two types of masks. I think most of the ones, you've got the anatomical shape there, the kind of teardrop. The other version you can have is a circle version. Um, they've all got that kind of soft padding in, which helps to contour better to the shape of the baby's face. And then what do you want to cover? Mouth, nose, or both? Both, good. Um, and so we've got one that's incorrect here because it's too big, covering the eyes, kind of Goldilocks style here, too small, not going to get a full seal and cover it. Um, but you ideally want, like here, covering the mouth and the nose. And then you've got various different techniques for um, positioning your hands. Uh, and the bigger your hands, in theory, people talk about uh, an anesthesia like having these large hands so you can pull up a jaw as, as an advantage. This may be the one case where it flips around and those of you with petite, dainty hands may have an advantage here um, because you've got to kind of fit a lot of fingers in real estate and we'll do this hands-on together. You want to avoid jamming that face down onto the baby, the mask onto the baby's face. Uh, avoid resting your hands on their eyes and avoid squashing the soft tissues in the neck and we'll do this together. And then the very end portion. Um, so we talked about how you are going to Check chest movement, ventilate. If you've got an LS or an potentially intubating if your heart rate is below 60. So if your ventilation is not working, what are you going to check? Airway, Airway reposition, good. Seal. Check your seal. Resuction. Potentially resuction, yep. So all of these are getting pretty, so the acronym that a lot of folks would recommend in uh, NRP uses is Mr. Soper. So mask readjustment, we're gonna make sure that we're gonna do that hands-on with you all soon um, to make sure that you've got a good seal, exactly like you suggested. Repositioning the airway, so you guys identify that so that you may not be in the right position. Resuction, again, you may have new secretions that are stopping you ventilating properly. Uh, you then may need to kind of more deliberately open the mouth and pull the jaw forward a little bit. Um, and then if you've got providers who are able to do it, you can increase the amount of pressure because the fluid might still be too much in there and you may need to use a little more force to pop those lungs open. And then we get into the weeds of intubating or using an LMA. And that's the very final portion there of the rhythm. This just gives you a sense of when people are intubating uh, these newborn babies, they're, as you might imagine, a whole different range of sizes of equipment and tubes and types of blades um, for uh, those who've got that. And then chest compressions, again, another skill that I want you all to feel like you're comfortable with. You saw from that NRP algorithm, it's if the baby has a heart rate that is not above 60 beats per minute within 15 to 30 seconds of adequate PPV. So you've got one minute, um, with all of your warm drying and stimulating. And if you haven't got adequate um, heart rate above 100, you should be starting PPV. And then you've got 30 seconds of adequate PPV. And if you have still not got a heart rate above 60, you should be starting chest compressions. So the strange thing there, right, is you could have a baby who's functionally born with really not much by way of a respiratory rate or a heart rate. You do not start with chest compressions. It's all about the respirations and the positive pressure ventilation to try and get those lungs moving. And then, who's, has anyone ever had to do neonatal chest compressions? Do you, do you feel comfortable sharing the kind of scenario? It was during okay. 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 And what technique did they have you doing for the? Do you want to? So do you want to show us how you were doing that? Okay. Right, right. So these things all interrelate. It's like a slippery fish that you are, they're like, keep them here and exactly here while I put an umbilical line in and I intubate and please do this on one leg. Yeah, with a... Well, I was reaching over because they were trying to intubate and do a whole bunch of other stuff. So I was just kind of... Right, it's tough it. enough in an adult-sized patient with four people around them trying to do all of these procedures. When you take this and shrink down your baby, your patient to this size, um, so one of the challenges with, two pers with the kind of two-finger compression technique is exactly as you described. You haven't got a lot of purchase or handle on the baby. You can easily be bumped off. Any other techniques? 
Yeah, and so do you, has, have you ever had to do that? And you want to show? No, we weren't able to do that just because of the, how tight the situation right. was. Right. Yep, and so we've got thumb encircling, and that's the, now the only technique that NRP actually recommends. So if we saw there, thumbs around, and where am I aiming to put my thumbs? Yeah, exactly just below that line between the nipples. You don't want to go too much lower or you'll end up over the xiphoid there and you'll snap that off. You don't want to come too far out or you're going to be over the ribs. Um, and there is an absolute risk of rib fractures. That's not the baby's biggest problem if you're having to deliver chest compressions, but they're going to be more effective if they're in the middle here. Fingers around the back. They do not have to be joining, right? There's no like, they're just around the back there. And then your thumbs, what do you think we're doing with them in between? So keeping them on, bouncing them off. Leave them on. Leave them on. So you want to give full recoil, but if you keep taking them off each time, that's kind of overdoing it and you potentially not as, uh, so the NRP recommendation is thumbs stay on the chest, but you got to give full recoil because you're trying to allow the heart to pump and, um, open um, the chambers of the heart to um, pump and open. So a video, a kind of pictorial version of it here. And this illustrates, I think, as you nicely described, the, the real estate challenge that you have, because you've got someone managing the airway here. You've got someone probably getting set up to try and get access to the umbilical cord while you're doing chest compression. So it is really tricky. Um, and then how are you going to coordinate Ventilations and compressions. What what uh, ratios have you got for other patients that you take care of? Straight on the money, three to one. So three, three watts. Three compressions to one breath. And so one and two and three and breathe. And that should take two seconds. And so that cycle gets repeated 30 times in a minute. So a couple of tips here. Avoid placing your thumbs on the ribs or the xiphoid we talked about. Fingers under the baby's back. Um, consider access for the rest of the team. Your optimal depth we didn't talk about. No reference anymore of number of centimeters. Helpful because my ability to visualize at the bedside exactly what 1.5 centimeters is is not that good. Nor is it relevant in babies who can vary in size. Right. So the recommendation is you're getting about one third of the AP diameter and that's still spatially challenging enough for most of us. That's about the depth you need to get effective compressions. And then as our colleague said, three compressions in one breath every two seconds. Allow recoil, but don't take your thumbs off the chest. So three to one, 120 events per minute, 90 compressions, 30 breaths. And so it's one and two and three and breathe and one and two and three and breathe. And I'd encourage you to call it out when you're doing it. Um, and so when we do our skills together, we will have a pair of folks doing compressions and ventilations and a pair observing them and kind of counting their rate and giving them feedback on how many they get done in a full minute. So it should be a total of 120. This box is my concern, not yours typically, but routes for medication at admin. We mentioned this briefly. How could you give medication to a baby in the setting? What's that? Through the umbilical cord? An IO, so the two-week code I referenced in my last shift, um, two weeks is the umbilical stump is going to be dried and crusted. The nurse has had 30 seconds, and if uh, predictably in a very volume depleted baby when they were not able to get IV access at that point, we placed an IO for the rest of their resuscitation of the baby. Um, and uh, NRP certainly mentions that. In a hospital environment, the umbilical line is uh, preferred. In a pre-hospital, and truthfully, potentially, I think even in an ED setting, an emergently delivered baby, an IO is probably more reliably and quickly placed. Uh, and the easy IO, has anyone ever used those in a SIM session? Or, so the smallest of those needles will still be able to be used in a, in a newborn baby. The caution I would give you is, you, how do you know when to stop drilling? What's that? you hear a pop, right? You don't drill it all the way down until it's sitting flush at the skin. Invariably, uh, we see uh, in the ER a large number of these go directly through if you do that. And so you need to be really sensitive to, I feel the pop, stop. So the, the last one I used, there was a decent amount of daylight between the hub of the needle and the skin that you just have to put some packing around to keep the needle stable. So we've got umbilical line IO. ET tube if needed, yeah. And then an IV if, pos if you've uh, got the ability to get that in. And the doses change, and we are not going to dwell on that. You've got to give more of a dose if you're giving it through the ET tube. 
You'll notice we've got through the whole lecture and we did not talk about APGAR scores. Anyone remember their own children or their own children's APGARs? Those are those funny numbers they call out at one in five minutes, right? You are not necessarily destined for Harvard just because you've got a 10 and a 10 on your APGARs at one in five minutes. Uh, none of the algorithm decision points were at all based on what an APGAR score is. It probably helps if you're calling ahead for me to get a sense of this baby has an APGAR, APGAR of 10. I've got a pretty clear picture of what that means because that means they've got no blue, and this is why, frankly, I think anyone who tells me they had an APGAR of 10 at one minute doesn't know how to do an APGAR or their baby had a problem, right? We talked about how a normal SAT for a baby at one minute is 65%. The baby probably looks blue all over and certainly is going to have those blue hands and feet. A perfectly pink baby at one minute is pretty abnormal. Heart rate's good at more than 100. Their cry, their um, response to stimulation is to sneeze, cough, or pull away. Their activity, they're doing the normal pulling up their legs and things, and they've got a strong cry. So if you call in and tell me you've got an APGAR of 10, I have a pretty clear idea of what baby is about to arrive in the ER. Finally, if you tell me an APGAR of zero, they're blue all over, they have no pulse, they've got no response to stimulation, no movement, and not breathing. So that's the equivalent of your GCS of three, right? Um, that is the score that a dead baby, unfortunately, would be getting. Um, but it can help you communicate. So summary questions before we do the hands-on. Four questions to ask before every delivery. Gestational age. Fluid, is the fluid clear? How many babies? And any risk factors. Great. Uh, do all babies require resuscitation? Nope. So 85% are going to do A-OK -okay without anything that you need to do beyond clamping the cord, getting them on mom's chest, keeping them warm and dry. When should you start PPV, positive pressure ventilation? One minute if you have not achieved heart rate greater than 100 in adequate respirations through warming, drying, and stimulation. When should you start chest compressions? Heart rate less than 60 after 30 seconds of adequate positive pressure ventilation. So 100 and 60 are your two key heart rates to remember. And then what's the correct rate of compressions and ventilations? Three to one. And then how many times does that cycle need to be repeated in a minute? Or how long should that take? Two seconds for three to one. And there you have covered the entire algorithm. So it's a long one page. Thankfully, this is where most babies end up and most of what uh, any pre-hospital or hospital environment happens here in terms of positive pressure ventilation. And the bottom stuff here is pretty uncommon. So we're now going to switch to the hands-on portion. If we take, do you want to take a five-minute break? And then, so let's take a little five-minute break. Uh, and then when we come back, we're going to work on warm, dry, stim, and suction, positive pressure ventilation, and chest compressions. Hey, yeah. Pleasure. Uh, Caleb. Question is, if, uh, if you're coming on scene and the baby's delivered and mm -hmm. it's not responding the way you want. Mm -hmm. gonna, how, how long are you going to do for that one minute and a half? Yeah, I, uh, so again, right no, I, I think I would start PPV immediately, okay. right? Realistically, okay. uh, it is not addressed in NRP if okay. the time of delivery is not known, but I think unless you kind of, they're like, because I think kind of people's estimates of times are so wildly off, right? They're like, it just happened. Right. Okay. I think if they're not responding, I would okay. just cut straight to PPV. Okay. Thank you. And it ultimately, right, like if they do well, you can stop your PPV, right? right? It's a right. pretty harmless, okay. you're not intubating a baby and leaving them stuck with a tube or something. Okay. So. Thank you. Of course. So you said that it was an emergency C-section that you were yeah, at? Yeah, so it was a non-compliant diabetic mother. The baby was hemorrhaging. All blue, at the heart rate was like... Not zero, but uh-huh. We tried ventilation at first. Good gig, so I assisted with compressions while they were intubating the line. Mm-hmm. So that's when we got home. Did the baby do okay in the end, you know? Or? Intubated, or, yep. Yeah, diabetic mother is one of the more common risk factors you're going to encounter, right? And so 
large babies, and then they also run into other problems. The problem is they were already in the national monitored, and then they saw the baby go under stress. Right, and we didn't talk about those funny monitors and the monitoring for D cells and the, all the, yeah. We need to go straight, yeah. Yes, those are scary. So once folks are coming back and getting stretched, if you could get set up in pairs um, and then identify a pair near to you and we'll basically have two people uh, doing the warm dry stem and then uh, one person on compressions and one ventilating while the other team pulls out their stopwatch phones to give you feedback on your rate uh, and anything else they're noticing. What's that? I guarantee you guys not to, children who tested me a couple months. Why was that? <laughs> so I, I work for Pulse Mountain Transportation uh -huh. up here. And we were taking a patient from Kennedy Trigger down to Children's for a doctor's appointment. Uh -huh. And on 95 South, right before he got to the ballway, we got rear-ended in an accident. So instead of the patient going to Children's for a doctor's appointment, the I came to an ER. ER Hi, delighted. A car accident. Delighted. <laughs> and Dad went with too. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. It was fun trying to get, get that kid out of the back of the Were they trick fed dependent well, on the patient was not exactly a pediatric. Mm -hmm. He was like nineteen twenty, mm -hmm. but had the mentality of like two year old. Mm. And was pretty much almost to a veg case. Mm-hmm. But we had one stretcher in the back of the ambulance and had to get a door popped, get the door open. So the one side was open, the side door would open because we just got rid of the jaws out to pop the second door. And it's like, seriously, I need to find another way to get him out of the way. I was not happy. No, it doesn't sound. I was not happy. I had fun. I mean, I had off work for the rest of the day. This was 7 30 in the morning. <laughs> Yeah. We have, we don't have the neonates, so we have infants. So with the mask covering the eyes, is there a complication? No, I mean, I think if that's, uh, if you've taken away from this that the priority is ventilating the lungs, if you can move the chest and get your response and heart rate. So there's no variable response with the eyes? In theory, you worry about it, in theory, but uh, I think your priority is the lungs. Gotcha. All right. Yep, so if folks are back, let's get started. For the live stream folks, for the live stream folks really fast, we're going to do more of a practical and we're going to cut off the live stream. So if you guys have any questions, now a minute or two. Mm -hmm. While we have the folks on the live stream, uh, I've put up a congratulations to you all for EMS week next week, EMSC day being the Wednesday of EMS week. Uh, the e national... Um, uh, EIIC Innovation Center has got a webinar at 1 p.m. on pre-hospital care of children and a review of evidence-based guidelines with a couple of national experts out of Colorado, uh, Houston, um, uh, and DC who are going to be putting this webinar on. It's the one hour. They're all great engaging speakers um, and would be, uh, I plan to be listening to it. So if anyone is available then, I think it'd be high yield for everyone. All right, so you guys are the lucky start off winners with the uh, bulb suction. So if we have you start off just making sure that everyone is comfortable with the basic stem techniques and um, uh, we will then move on to compressions and ventilation.